So good evening. Uh, my name is Mikkel Adgate. I am a senior advisor at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. So excited to welcome you all this evening for our very first kickoff for our citywide long-term control plan. Um, this meeting has been a long time in the making. I want to make sure to thank Karen Argenti and her team at BCEQ, Councilmember Cohen for joining us tonight, um, and all the folks from Community Board 8 who have been really helpful over the last few years in thinking about um, this long-term control plan in particular um, and a specific focus on the Harlem River and the Hudson River. Um, we have a lot of content to get through this evening, um, talking about sort of the two water bodies, um, different improvement projects that we've had over the years, and then really getting into the heart of what an LTCP is, what kind of work will be taking place over the next year or so, um, and then we'll have lots of times to talk about next steps and go through um, a question and answer session. So just to get started, I think a lot of you are very familiar with this term, but for those that aren't, we'd like to take a step back um, and think about how our sewer system is designed. Uh, many of you know that most of New York, including the majority of the Bronx, is served by what we call a combined sewer system. So that means that on dry days, our sewer is taking all of the sanitary waste that we generate whenever we flush the toilet, do the laundry, to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. But that pipe also has the capacity to take stormwater runoff. So if you look at the image on the left, that stormy weather condition, um, what you can see is that the rain is going into the sewer, it's mixing with the sanitary waste, and it's going to the wastewater treatment plant for treatment, though in some rain events, that mixture of sanitary waste and stormwater runoff is discharging um, out of an outfall in what we call a combined sewer overflow, or a CSO. So you'll hear that term a lot this evening, and we're talking specifically about um, CSO reduction and mitigation. In terms of what types of rainfalls can trigger a CSO event in the Hudson or Harlem River, it really does vary. So the way to think of it is that um, a very intense rainstorm over a short period of time could result in a CSO, um, or a little bit of rain over a long period of time could result in a, a CSO. So if you think of an inch of rain that was falling over the course of two days, there might not be a CSO event. But if there was an inch of rain within an hour, there could be a CSO event. So a lot of that depends on the intensity, the duration of the rainstorm, and also the characteristics of the drainage area. So when we look at the average in terms of rainfall events between the Hudson and the Harlem River, about 25% of the average rainfall events could result in a CSO event. And we'll sort of get into more detail about that as we go through data later in the presentation. So thinking about how do we address this? How do we think critically about water quality improvements in New York City? think about CSO and their impact on water quality. We have what's called a CSO consent order and agreement with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, which requires the city to develop what's called a long-term control plan, or LTCP. And the purpose of that plan is for us to look at the characteristics of the water body, um, and identify different types of CSO controls or projects that could be implemented to help achieve current water quality standards. So the city has submitted several of these long-term control plans over the years, um, and we are currently kicking off the LTCP for what's called the Citywide or East River Open Waters LTCP. And this is really our largest LTCP because we're covering a significant portion of the city. Um, so the top of this slide actually says LTCP process, 
and where the public gets involved throughout the process. So you can see that we've been doing some data collection, and that's what we'll be presenting to all of you this evening. And we're having this public kickoff so that we can share what data we've collected and sort of the key takeaways in our assessment of that data. Then over the next several months, we'll be going through a process where we'll be modeling and we'll be looking at different types of alternatives or projects that could be um, implemented or simply assessed to look at um, how we could reduce the impacts of CSOs. And what we'll do is we'll come back to you at a later date for what we call our alternatives meeting. And we'll share with you all of the different types of CSO control projects that we've evaluated to get your opinion on them. Then we'll be developing this long-term control plan. And we'll be having what's called a final plan review meeting. Um, for those of you who are able to join our November 15th meeting, where we did a citywide, um, an annual meeting where we talked about LTCPs throughout the city, we committed to sharing the final plan or the selected alternative with the public before we submit it to the state. And so that'll take place at this final plan review meeting, where we'll be able to come to you and say, here's what's been evaluated, here um, are the costs, the benefits, here's the proposal that we're planning to submit to the state so that you can review it and provide comments before we submit it to the state for their approval. So that's sort of the full process before we submit to DEC, and this will take place over the course of the next year. So again, just to give you a sense of how large this long-term control plan is, we really had three separate um, phases of sampling. And so tonight, we're talking specifically about the Hudson and Harlem River, that's up in green with the phase one. Um, we will have another meeting in March where we'll talk about the East River side, um, sort of the northern portion of East River. And then we'll have another, a third kickoff meeting to focus on phase three and the New York Harbor. Um, so this is really our first time doing three separate kickoff meetings, but it was really important for us to come out to different communities so that you could really get a lot of detail um, about the sampling that was done, and we can go through the different alternatives for each of these different phases as we evaluate them. So we've actually already started to receive some comments from the public. So I know Karen and BCEQ, with support from Community Board 8, have already started talking to, I believe, many of you that are here tonight to let us know what are really important and fundamental principles that the community wants the city to understand. Um, so we just want to make sure that it was clear to everyone that we're already reviewing the, these comments. We're taking them into consideration. We'll continue to do that with any comments that we receive this evening. And when we come back um, later this year to talk about the alternatives, we'll really be able to dive into our responses to these specific comments. So specific things like considering green infrastructure as the pre preferred alternative. We've definitely heard that from this community from a variety of different ways. The emphasis on green infrastructure, not just the design and construction of it, but maybe a maintenance plan for whatever GI um, is implemented. Um, a lot of comments about the LTCP process, being able to evaluate and provide comments to whatever the selected alternative is before it's submitted to the state. Um, and thinking through about different design options for green infrastructure that go above and beyond what we're currently implementing throughout the city. So as we go through the next several months of developing this long-term control plan, we'll continue to check in with all of you, but also provide um, responses and recommendations that speak directly to the comments that we've gotten to date. So at this point, I want to kick it over to my colleague, Keith Mahoney, who will go into more details about the data that's been collected. Okay. Thank you, Mikkel. Uh, good evening. I'm Keith Mahoney with the New York City DEP. Um, I'm going to be discussing the water body and watershed characteristics 
So this is kind of the first phase of the public participation process. So as part of this, we just we need to uh, characterize the whole water body and the watershed. So this one just shows kind of the drainage areas, what contributes to the water bodies. So you can see uh, Ward's Island is the primary contributor, contributor to the Harlem River with a little bit from North River and a little more for Hunts Point. In terms of the Hudson River, North River is the primary contributor to that. So the drainage areas that contribute are those. So we look at those treatment plants, and that's how our models are set up. And these areas are primar primarily combined systems, 83 to 90%. And uh, some of the separate areas are more direct drainage. Uh, the other thing we look at are things like land use and all population projections. So this just shows the overall land use, primary residential, followed by mixed residential commercial, and some of the other ones. There's a lot of open space in these areas. So this, these are all plugged into the models in terms of the impervious cover, in terms of rainfall, runoff, things like that. Um, so what we do is part of the mo as part of the analysis, we look at the um, CSO volumes by outfall, and these all modeled numbers we use with our landside models. So, so we have um, CSO volumes by outfall. So you can see that there's a few key outfalls that make up the uh, majority of the overflows. So this is for the Hudson River. You can see that in the larger ones, NC076, followed by NR027, NR043, and then the 48 other outfalls that make up 61%. So we try to focus on the larger outfalls. We also look at water quality, which I'll get into. Uh, when you get into the Harlem River, you're looking at some of the larger outfalls. And here you have um, ones like Woods Island 56, makes up 31% of the CSO discharges. Woods Island 60, 21%, and the other three, uh, 62, 46, 57, make up 20%, then 38 outfalls, 28%. So again, we really try to focus on the larger outfalls for this. Um, again, the other thing you can look at is on the bottom is on the other one too. Again, these are really combined systems. So you can see CSO is really dominates in terms of wet weather discharges, no MS4 here, and others really direct drainage and things like that. What's MS4? Uh, municipal storm sewer, s separate storm sewer system. <laughs> and those are just the city owned. So there are other storm water, there's private ones. If there's not a permit, they're not MS4, but still storm water direct sources, and there's also direct overland runoff. But yeah, it's the separate storm sewer systems. Uh, in terms of the water quality standards, uh, these water bodies primarily are class I, which is secondary contact. Um, the dissolved oxygen standard is um, never less than 4 milligrams per liter. The bacteria standard for both class I and class S are the same. Uh, fecal coliform, uh, monthly geomean greater than or equal to 200 um, colonies per 100 milliliters. And there's also a total coliform, which is kind of obsolete now, but it's still on the books. So we look at that. Uh, in terms of the SB, like I said, the uh, bacteria stands are the same. Uh, dissolved oxygen stands are slightly different. It's duration-based, never less than 3 milligrams per liter, which is a acute standard, and then um, a duration base between 3 and 4.8, which is the chronic standard. Aside from this, we also look at um, some other um, LTP goals and targets we established with the New York State DEC. Um, we look at a seasonal bacteria compliance. We look at the summer months, May through October, which is when people are more likely to be using the water bodies. We look at um, the annual dissolved oxygen compliance. We look at time to recovery, which is not an actual standard, but we try to look at after a wet weather event, there's going to be elevated bacteria. We want to see when it drops the lowest. Uh, statistical, a statistical value that we think indicates it would be safe to swim and that would, they would be meeting its ge monthly geo mean. Uh, we look at things like aesthetics, like floatable control, oil and grease, things like that. And lastly, we also um, assess our compliance against um, EPA recreational water quality criteria, which is a new standard using enter enterococcus as the um, pathogen indicator. So as uh, part of the uh, water body characterization, there's um, significant sampling going on. So we've tried to first look at the existing sampling, what's out there. 
So we have both the harbor survey monitoring as well as the sentinel monitoring. These are both New York City DEP programs in which we collect water quality samples throughout the year. Uh, for the harbor survey, we do it um, four to- um, once a week in the warm months, um, May through October, and we do it once a month in the winter months, November through March. Uh, as I said, we also have the river um, keeper and the citizen. We have the third-party sampling, and this is more for, they use enterococcus, and again, this is more for um, the warmer months, uh, May through October. So aside from the existing data, we know there's still some data gaps, especially for the model calibration and the model verifications. So we collect additional data. First of all, we collect our flow monitoring data, and we do this throughout the city. We had our two locations, Hudson River and Harlem River. We install a number of flow monitors in the sewer to help us characterize the wet weather flows and help us calibrate the landside models. We're using an InfoWorks uh, CS model for the sewer system. So we use that for the calibration verification, and we typically run that for four or five months to calibrate the models. We have some other sources, too, to help verify everything. We have satellite flyover data from Pervious. We have previous uh, flow monitoring we conducted. So all this leads into the final calibrated landside model. We then also look at the receiving water. So again, we have those other data sources, but again, once a week isn't always enough for um, this kind of calibration. And it's also the spatial resolution isn't quite enough. So we have a lot more stations. Again, 10 stations, Hudson River, six in the um, Harlem River. We try to do midwater as long, along with near shore to try to capture the dynamics of the water body. And probably more importantly is we chase wet weather events. So when it rains and we have a confirmed CSO overflow, we'll go out there, we'll sample twice a day, low tide, high tide, for four consecutive days. The first three days are really for the wet weather to see the bacterial die off. The fourth day is for a dry weather sample. So we really chase wet weather events for this. So we look at bacteria. We also have the YSI, just the probe, temperature, salinity, things like that for the hydrodynamic model. Um, as long as this, we also do um, with the flow monitoring, we have the CSO and MS4 sampling. So where we're doing our flow monitoring on the land side, we also collect samples so we know what the concentrations of CSO and MS4 are, so we know the actual loadings for the CSO in the stormwater. So again, we target our five wet weather events, our number of samples, so we get an accurate geo mean. And we also, in this water body, look at some of the other parameters like CBOD and nitrogen. So this is the results from um, both the um, long-term control plan sampling along with the New York City DEP harbor survey monitoring and sentinel monitoring programs. So what we try to do on this um, graph is lump everything together. So you see um, the orange dots are the dry weather days. The blue dots, or purple, I'm colorblind, I apologize, are the wet weather days. Like I said, the wet weather days are three consecutive days after wet weather events. And the orange dots are four days after a wet weather event that indicate dry weather. So that's what the individual samples look like for both Harbor Survey Sentinel and the long-term control plan. And the boxes you see there are the geometric means. Uh, The lines above it are what the the water quality standard is. Fecal coliform, the monthly geo means 200. Again, this isn't meant to show attainment or anything like that. It just gives you an indication where the water quality is right now. And overall, the water quality looks very good with the geo means below the um, standard for both dry and wet weather days. Uh, this next one is the uh, same plot, but instead of using fecal coliform for bacteria, we use enterococcus, which is the EPA water quality, recreational water quality criteria. On this one, they're proposing 30 or 35 for um, 30 day monthly, a 30 day geo mean. So we're looking at 30 as a more um, stringent criteria. And again, same thing the orange is dry weather, the purple, the wet weather. Shows a little more variability, but the geo means are all below that. Um, the line, that 30 um, colonies per 100 milliliters. So again, all this data is really meant, it's good to show the water quality, but it's really meant to calibrate the model. So this is all being plugged into our water quality models. Uh, This next one just gets into Hudson River, and this starts looking at dissolved oxygen. Again, the dissolved oxygen, the only... um, 
portion of the water body that's a class SB, which is primary contact, is the northern portion of the Hudson River above the Harlem River, and that's the um, HUD 1N1. Aside from that, the rest of the water body is class I, so the upper portion has a duration base from 3 to 4.8 milligrams per liter. Uh, the remainder is never less than 4 and just shows where the dissolved oxygen lies. And it's, uh, dissolved oxygen wise, the water body looks very well, very good. So we took all this data. These are still preliminary model runs. We're still looking to calibrate. We're working with New Jersey to kind of get their loadings because the Hudson's kind of a mixed water body. So we're working with both um, municipalities. But in terms of preliminary evaluation using the model, overall attainment right now looks very good. We had a few minor hits at some of the stations, um, the Hudson River 3 and Hudson River 2 and 3. We had that both for the... Um, fecal and for the entero, but again preliminary, but overall water quality looks pretty good in these water bodies. So now we get to the um, Harlem River, uh, same plots. Right now we're looking at fecal coliform. Again, all the indi individual samples and the geo mean shown in the box. Again, dry and wet weather. A uh, similar thing to what we saw in the Hudson River. Geo means here are a little high. You see one excursion for the wet weather above the um, water quality standard of 200. But other than that, I mean, the water, it looks pretty good, particularly in dry weather. Uh, next one is Intero, uh, same plots. Again, dry and wet weather. And again, for the Intero, you see a little more elevated for the wet weather above the um, EPA recreational water quality standard of 30. But again, overall, the water bodies look pretty, pretty good. And this is the uh, last one in terms of water quality, dissolved oxygen. Again, looks pretty good. This one's class I, so it's never less than four across the entire Harlem River. You see a few uh, excursions. Those are in the bottom waters, but nothing too significant. We're well, not getting really hypoxic or anything like that. And again, this, so this is the water quality modeling for that. So we again look at the uh, fecal coliform, the enterococcus. And again, we're looking at full attainment. In terms of fecal coliform, uh, for entero, full attainment with the 30-day geo mean we're projecting. Recreational season, they also have um, a monthly STV. It's a 90th percentile that EPA looked at. It's part of the EPA recreational water quality criteria, and that's a value of 110. So this is the number of times it's um, above 110. So you see some non-attainment there. So that's it in terms of the water quality. I'm not sure I'm going to do questions now. Or questions? If there's any questions on that, I can jump back. Sure. Uh, your sampling was taken from Mid Channel and all these areas? No, no. We tried to do some near shore in this one. So in a few areas, it's hard to see on these maps, but a few areas we tried to do a transect. And we know um, New Jersey with their sampling in the huts, and they're doing some transects too, which we're going to be sharing our data with them to do the final calibration. But yeah, in this one, and for the whole citywide open waters, being these water bodies is so big, we try to get some near shore for the um, Hudson River and some of the inner and outer bay. Yes? One question and one point. Do you chase 311 reports of dry weather discharge? Oh, yeah, that's, we don't for this program. We, that's under another program, and part of that data is in there, but that's the IDDE, IDDE program, the illicit discharge. Okay detection and elimination program. So we're aware of that program, and if we find something, we inform them too. In this water body, we didn't find anything. Other water bodies, we did. So once we saw something that was suspected illicit discharge, we would inform them, and they would do a <coughs> thorough track down. The other thing, 2016 was an extremely dry summer. Last summer, 2017, was not dry. Mm -hmm. The counts were much worse. It's, and that's why it's hard to... Again, we try to trace the wet weather events. So every time we sample, we make sure there's confirmed CSO events, and that's why we're relying more on the model. Because some of our sampling we got in 2015, which is a wet year, it switches around. So that's why it's, we really rely on the models. And we'll get into that a little later, I think, in terms of how we use the models. But we look at, when we do a final analysis, we look at 10 years of data using 2002 through 2011, where we get some extreme wet weather events, particularly 2011. But yeah, we do try to account for that.
Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So the next portion of the presentation, we get into the uh, water quality improvement projects, both uh, gray and green. So the first one just goes over existing projects. So these are ones that are already in the CSO consent order. These are in the baseline assumptions. So in terms of this water body, we have Wards Island. The plant recently, the plant used to have a wet weather capacity of 500 MGD. Uh, I'm saying recently, it's probably like 10, 15 years ago, it's been upgraded to 550 MGD. As part of that upgrade, they needed to do some improvements to the plant. So right now there's two projects uh, one is reconstruction of the six main sewage pumps to make sure they can reliably pump and treat 550 MGD. And the other one, which was recently completed, was a replacement of the boss screen. So that's a headworks of the plant. So when the flow comes in, there's a grit chamber that removes heavy solids, and there's a boss screen that collects floatables, any debris that may be in the sewage. The old boss screens just get clogged, flood out the chamber. So they just recently sold these new boss screens to make sure that screens don't get clogged and they, they can convey the flow to the pump. So those two projects, one's completed, one on, is underway, and that's going to enable Wards Island to reliably treat 550 and reduce CSOs into the Harlem River. Uh, the other one is North River upgrade. This one isn't um, really a CSO project. We just thought it was worth mentioning. This is the replacement of pumps, blowers, and mainly it's a cogeneration facility. So they're trying to have beneficial use of the digest, the gas, the methane to power the equipment there. So that one's really more a beneficial use in terms of reducing VOCs, uh, greenhouse gases, reducing truck traffic when it's uh, completed. So that's just really uh, trying to be more uh, sustainable as a process. So I just wanted to mention that project. And uh, right now I'm going to hand it over to Melissa. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa Enoch. I'm here and happy to represent our green infrastructure team back at DEP. And I'm going to talk about the opportunities we have available for private property um, in these watersheds. So first and foremost, we have our green infrastructure grant program. We've been running this program since 2012. Um, over kind of big picture stats, we've committed $15 million to 34 projects. Um, in 2016, we completed four projects. We initiated another, 20, um, another two. In the, these two watersheds, we've funded eight projects. I've put some pictures here of two of those, uh, Ballet Tech Condominium and the new school. We've done a series of green roofs at each of these. Really nice projects. Um, I'm also really happy and excited to mention that we've recently kicked off a partnership with our colleagues at the New York City Housing and Pre Preservation um, Department. So this has been a long time um, in the works. We've often talked about how wonderful it would be to integrate green infrastructure into new construction projects that HPD is implementing as a part of their uh, affordable housing program. And we finally kind of figured out the nuances of the funding and how to get that um, partnership rolling. So we funded one project um, collectively with them in fiscal year 18. We have another five projects in fiscal year 19 that we're working on and a pipeline through 2022 of projects that um, we hope to just keep funding um, green infrastructure on. So again, these, uh, according to our colleagues at HPD, you know, one of the things that happens uh, with green infrastructure on these new construction projects is that they get value engineered out at the end of the day um, because costs, you know, continue to accrue in these projects and get larger and larger. And so the green spaces can tend to uh, fall off of the, the portfolio of the project. So we've really wanted to pick these up and it looks like we've got this figured out. So we're excited to announce that. Even more exciting, I think, is a new private property retrofit that we are launching this year. We've um, done a lot of outreach on this, and a lot of stakeholders from this community have provided input. We released a, an RFI, a request for information, in 2016, asking industry experts to tell us how to structure a new uh, private property program, given that our 
current green infrastructure grant program has been in place in, since 2012, and we've kind of struggled with um, getting a, a large quantity of acres from that program. So this is our, our next phase of the program, what we think is going to be a really great solution. Um, we're looking to retrofit 200 greened acres in um, five to seven years. That's very large. Uh, we think it's achievable, and we've structured this program to really encourage uh, an external program administrator to aggregate and bundle projects to get cost and savings uh, efficiencies that we haven't been able to secure on private property to date due to the various kind of burdensome things that we've found happening in our current program. So this property, or this program is going to be open citywide combined sewer sites, and uh, we're really excited to see how it turns out. So we've identified sites that are 50,000 square feet and greater and on, that are privately owned in the combined sewer area. That's the first target of this new program. Um, we have about 1,600 sites. So we'll be releasing uh, an RFP, a request for proposals, in um, hopefully in two or three months in the next quarter of this year to select a program, administra a program administrator to externally administer the program. We will be jump-starting outreach for this program in March, um, and we'll be looking to a lot of you to help us connect with private property owners because we understand that we don't necessarily have those uh, relationships that you have, and we're really going to need to utilize you to get people to sign up for this. Um, we see this as being kind of the next big driver of our program. We've done a lot of effort in the right-of-way. We're doing a lot of work on public on-site, and private property is our next big push, and we can't really do it without um, the support of our stakeholders and um, selecting a good team to run the program. So keep your eyes out for that. And finally, just want to mention two other opportunities to get green infrastructure on private property. Uh, the Department of Buildings runs uh, a property tax abatement for green roofs. That information is all on their website, uh, the current dollar per square foot uh, that they are um, reimbursing for or, or reducing property taxes for is up here on the screen. That does sunset in March. Uh, we haven't heard, has anybody heard if that's getting renewed? Um, not too sure of the renewal status of that. I think there were some organizations working on um, on checking that out. So um, as we learn more about what's happening to it, we can keep you posted. Uh, in addition, DEP amended um, city code in 2012 to create a new stormwater performance standard for combined sewer properties in the city. Um, where they're going through substantial or major redevelopment. And this code uh, change requires a, um, a more a strict release rate to the city's combined sewer system. And green infrastructure is an opportunity for private developers to, um, to kind of meet this rule. And we have a really great guideline uh, document on our website that explains to them how to use green infrastructure to help control the release rate on their properties. So another opportunity to continue to get green infrastructure in the city in combined sewer areas. So, sure, we can do a couple questions. Sure. Hi, I'm not sure if my information is accurate. But as I understand it, uh, the loans to private uh, individuals to want to do green infrastructure come with a 20-year lien on the property. And that is such a disincentive that it makes it seem like it's disingenuous effort because I can't imagine anybody wanting to do that. Yeah. I can understand wanting to have a hook into them until they actually do it, that they don't take the money and not do it. But right. do it in, in 18 months or whatever, mm -hmm. You know, that would be long enough, and then it should be just a standard loan. But sure. Yeah. So um, did everybody hear the question? Okay. So um, the question was about, or comment really, was about how our current green infrastructure grant program has a burdensome 20-year burdensome restrictive covenant um, that property owners must sign to commit to maintaining, maintaining and keeping that asset on their property. We agree with you. I think that's the 
the largest reason why our numbers uh, for that program aren't very high. Um, and that's why we are rolling out this, uh, this new program that I mentioned. So um, the, the current program is funded with capital dollars, and so that 20-year restrictive covenant is, is tied to our, cap our, our bonds, the, you know, the life of our bonds. It has to match the life of the asset. Um, and that has been a problem for private property owners. Um, we've had a lot of people who've made it work, and mostly because they're institutional properties, they're not planning on going anywhere, they have their um, mortgages paid off, you know, it's institutions, uh, churches, hospitals, universities, you know, and, and that's great. And those are kind of low-hanging fruit for us, too, and, and we found a nice way to fund them. This program um, will have a different requirement. There will be some sort of agreement for that the property owner has to sign in order to maintain um, or commit to maintaining the asset because that's something that's really important for us. We're using taxpayer dollars to build the screen infrastructure. So there, there has to be something um, for them to agree to, but it will look a lot different than what's required in the green infrastructure grant program. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Melissa. Um, can you consider decreasing the parking requirement for uh, that's required by zoning for commercial and residential developments? So um, the question was, can we consider decreasing parking requirements for commercial um, and other types of properties in the city? So um, DEP can't really do that. That's not something we have control over. There was a task force um, when the green code was uh, put was created and rolled out, and and there were some minor modifications uh, to parking requirements um, made, but that's a little outside of um, the realm, you know, the responsibility of DEP and what we're allowed to to do. Um, That'd be a nice one, though. I it, don't know. <laughs> I don't think that would go over very well with the public. Yeah, people like their parking. parking is, yeah, it's like the third rail. Yeah, I you know I know that um, our colleagues at the parks department you know have had similar you know um, pushes right because there's a lot of uh, underutilized space in parking lots that really could be for trees, green infrastructure, um, you know other um, environmentally friendly and and things that help us achieve our um, other goals. So. Yeah, that's a tough one. Sure. So um, the retrofitting of the privately owned sites, is there a water storage goal or like what's the criteria for the success of each project? Sure. So for um, so for our current green infrastructure grant program, our standard is one inch. We're, we're looking to manage one inch of stormwater over the impervious area. Um, for the new private incentive program, we're pushing the, the bar a little bit here, and we're looking to manage one and a half inches from surrounding impervious tributary area. And I didn't really explain what a greened acre means, but I have a little asterisk here that I understand is probably hard for, your, for you in the back to read. But um, the, the way we're defining a green acre, and in the industry defines it, as one inch of rainfall uh, over one acre of impervious surfaces. So when we move that up to 1.5 inches, uh, the impervious surfaces decreases. But what we're really saying here is we're looking for volume. We're trying to get additional volume from impervious surfaces because that's really what we're, we're after. Um, and I think this program is going to help us do that. And you'll notice in, in some of our other... Uh, programs like our public on-site program is now has moved to 1.25 inches, um, and so we're exploring these other opportunities. Just to follow up on that, do you have a way to incentivize new construction to store even more water, like maybe even take some water from off-site? Like if somebody was doing a block-sized large-scale development and they you wanted to store some of the street water or something. That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that. Uh, city code doesn't allow us to manage uh, right-of-way runoff on private property. 
that is something other municipalities are doing. Philadelphia has been very successful at making that work on their private pro private um, projects. And, uh, you know, something that, that is definitely interesting. Um, we're able to do that in some of our public projects where we have a commitment um, from our partners like uh, Parks and uh, we can find really good opportunities. It, it kind of has to make sense because that's a, a large amount of volume and location has to be just right and the crown of the streets. And um, so that's something that's, that's an interesting concept. Won't be allowed in this new program, unfortunately. So, we can? Okay. So I think I'm turning it back over to Pete. Thanks, Melissa. Um, the next portion, pretty quick. Um, the next meeting, we're really going to get into details in terms of the alternative developments, the alternatives of CSO mitigation, both green and gray. This is just a general overview. I talked about this a little earlier. So it's part of this uh, water body watershed characterization. We have the landslide models. We ha had them calibrated for years now, so we, we collected additional data. I mentioned the satellite flyover data, the flow monitoring data. As, along with the uh, point source sampling, so we characterize the uh, land side model, both the um, flows and the loadings. Uh, water quality model, like I said too, um, we took all the existing data sources, we supplemented with the LTCP sampling, 10 stations Harlem River, I'm um, sorry, 6 stations Harlem River, 10 stations Hudson River. So we use all that to calibrate the water quality model in terms of pathogens and also for our dissolved oxygen. Uh, in terms of then, we try to then compare everything on an uh, equalized basis, and that was a question about the rainfall. Every year we collect samples. We chase this wet, wet, wet weather event. Sometimes we waste money because we'll mobilize. There won't be a CSO, so we'll just have the field crews waiting and have nothing to collect. So for us, wet years are always better because it gives us easy data to collect. But we have some drought years, so we have to work with it. Sometimes we have to sample longer periods of time. But again, we take all that data and we plug it into the model so we have a calibrated model. So then with that model, uh, the bottom graph kind of shows the rainfall year we use. In terms of the CSO policy, they say you should evaluate it against a typical year. It's always hard to understand what a typical year is. So we thought we were a little conservative. We uh, selected uh, JFK Airport 2008 data, which was 46 inches of rain that year. It was slightly wet, more in the summer months. So that was our typical year. But for a recommended plan and even the baseline analysis, we figured there is no typical year. So we took that 10-year period that's shown there that was really one of the highest rainfalls in a rolling average 10-year period. So we take 2002 through 2011. So that's what we run the recommended plans through along with the baseline and the 100% analysis through. Aside from that, um, we're projecting the future. So we look at the 2040 sanitary flows that we get from um, the Department of City Planning. And we also include uh, other things such as uh, planned upgrades. So for dissolved oxygen, besides CSO, things like nitrogen, nutrients really impact the dissolved oxygen, particularly in the East River and other things. So we look at the committed B&R projects. We, we committed over a billion, committed, we already constructed over a billion dollars worth of construction in the Upper East River to remove nitrogen from the plants, Tolman Island, Ward's Island, Hunts Point, and Barry Bay. So that's all in the baseline. So we use that with the CSO, just get the loading into the water body to run the water quality models. And that's how we assess all the alternatives as well as baseline. So in terms of the CSO evaluation process, uh, the things we look at, um, again, I talked about some of this. One thing we look at is the gap analysis. We do this for everything because we want to see what is the best you can do. It's like you can spend all the money you want. And you may not be able to attain any water quality due to other things. Maybe there's stormwater loadings. Maybe there's just no circulation. So on number two, we do um, a gap analysis. So we take the baseline conditions. Then we say, what would the water body look like if you had 100% CSO control? So that's kind of the best we can do. And we kind of, that's kind of early on in the analysis, just to kind of see um, level the field. What, how high could we get? So when we sort of value an alternative, we know what's the ultimate goal. Um, again, we have other things, assessing water quality necessary to achieve the water quality standards. That's all lumped in there. And again, cost effective. They're all lumped in. So I'm going to jump to the next slide, which is the toolbox. So 
Uh, this is a generic one. When we look at alternatives, it may not always, always be accurate, but this is a simplified one. So we look at increasing complexity and increasing cost. And again, very general. So up front, we have source control. You have green infrastructure. Other than that, you have storm sewer build out, just trying to get storm sewer out of the combined system, storm flow out of the combined system. Uh, we look at system optimization. A lot of this has been done. We'll probably look at more of this in terms of the open waters, in terms of with the sewer system McKellar talked about earlier. So we have an old system. You had sewers that would actually discharge right into receiving water. After they saw all the water quality impacts, they built interceptor sewers that would intercept the flow. So they put regulators in. It would divert the flow into an intercepting sewer to a treatment plant. So some of the things we look at is with those regulators is, is the ways we can optimize the regulator, send more of the wet weather flow to the treatment plant, and reduce the CSOs. Uh, as it gets higher up, you start looking at things, well, maybe we need parallel sewers to keep the hydraulic grade line neutral. Uh, we look at things like bending weirs, control gates, and as you go further on, we can add additional pump stations. That also helps with resiliency, things like that, for sea level rise and uh, pump station expansion. So that's kind of in the toolbox. Uh, CSO relocation is something we look at. Sometimes you may be going, it's not really for the open waters, but sometimes you may be going to a dead-end trib where if you can get the water out of the dead-end trib into an open waters where the circulation, there'll be less of a water quality impact. Uh, the other one, uh, water quality and ecological enhancements. Again, we look at things, and this we look at every water body, floatables control, oils and grease, trying to reduce that, just the aesthetics from the receiving water. We get into things, again, probably not applicable to Harlem River and Hudson River, environmental dredging, which you have a lot of CSO sediments is something that may cause odors and things when they're exposed at low tides. Um, we're looking at things, these two we actually added specifically for these water bodies is wetland restoration, it could be even blue belts, things like that. Daylighting. This is more for the Tibbetts Brook. What happens, Tibbetts Brook is, um, so the Park Department is doing a more of a wetland restoration, an uh, ecological restoration of Tibbetts Brook in Van Cortland Park. What this is, daylighting is, that flow right now goes into a combined sewer system, so it takes up sewer capacity, goes to the Wards Island treatment plant during wet weather. It's a lot of excess wet weather flow going to the plant. Uh, daylighting is kind of a fancy term, and... But basically, we don't want to send in a combined sewer. We would like to find an outlet into the East River, into the Harlem, I'm sorry, into the Hudson River, into the Harlem River to take that lake flow instead of going to a treatment plant and wasting that capacity. And daylighting would be the optimum solution if you can actually build like a stream or something all the way towards the Harlem River. It's, a lot of times property acquisition is difficult, but that's the daylighting concept that we're looking at. Um, as we... <laughs> As we go further down the chart, we have the treatment in terms of it probably booing on the outflow disinfection, but disinfection, retention treatment basins, which would be floatables control, solids removal, and disinfection. High rate clarification is physical chemical. We try to really uh, remove the solids in a very small footprint using chemicals and ballast to take the solids out, along with disinfection to treat the bacteria. And the last one is storage. Again, we look at in-system, typically not as viable as we, then we talked about um, a shaft is really a deep shaft that's really more of a tank, but instead of having the footprint of, the footprint of a tank, it's a shaft goes down a few hundred feet, then we go further along, we go over a tank all the way to a tunnel, which could be a soft soil tunnel, a rock tunnel, and that's really for storage. So we take the CSO, we store it, after the wet weather event, we'll pump it back either to the treatment plant or to a satellite treatment facility. So that's the most costly, but that's how we're looking at the alternatives, and as part of the CSO policy, we have to look up to 100% CSO removal. And I'm going to, I'm sorry, any questions? Yes? Why is um, rest, wetland restoration and daylight considered complex? Uh, I, I did, I'm sorry. And this, we put that we tried to simplify everything. It isn't always. Okay. Sometimes it is, and it's a very oversimplified table. Sometimes I hate presenting this table. In some <laughs> cases, it could be. <laughs> Tibbetts Brook may be expensive for the daylighting, and sometimes... It's expensive, I'm not going to court. I'm just complex. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's too oversimplified. And it's, same thing with floatables control. What makes it complex and expensive? It's less complex, but it's, it, it becomes right. more, but again, it's site-specific. 
Sometimes we can do floatables in existing regulator. Other times, if you put floatables in an existing like regulator outfall, there's not hydraulic capacity, so you have to rebuild the entire. So again, this is very oversimplified, but it's yeah, it's not always the case. Yes. Have you given any thought in this plan to restoring shellfish like oysters to clean the water? We haven't that much in this plan. We are looking at it as part of the BNR plan. But in, in terms of this plan, we haven't. It's something we could take back. I mean, it, the oysters do filter out bacteria and all. It's something we could take back again. Yes? On that, rip mussels. Yeah. Yes. There was, a, there was a study by NOAA and Fisheries at, um, at the outfall of the Bronx River. And they said that putting rib mussels in suck a lot of the stuff out, bad stuff out of the water, and they're not edible anyway. Yeah. They're not as fussy as oysters. I know, and I know fu oysters you need this certain kind of the, the bottom characteristics. And, and, and we should just add that we do have several oyster restoration projects where we're collecting data on how they're doing, and yeah, so... Rib mussels are a problem because since there's no market for them, you cannot get spat. Right, right. You don't have to worry about the public consuming them. But you can't get seed. They don't exist. Okay. There's, there's projects in New Jersey who they're, they're, they, they could produce it if they got grant money. Okay. It's something we can definitely take back. Because we did look at that. I know it's in terms of the nitrogen program we looked at that. But yeah, the CSO program, we haven't been looking at that. We can definitely take it back. Yes. Who is looking at the problems of uh, heavy metal pollution? We look at it in, again, we typically go by the 303D list, the New York State DC 303 list in terms of the impairments of the water body. And I think all these water bodies are typically just bacteria and dissolved oxygen or just bacteria or I'm not even sure what they, but the heavy metals haven't shown up on these open waters. Well, that's probably, I mean, that's one of the problems that you have with fishing in that the water might be clean enough for swimming, but you certainly you don't want to eat the fish. Right, and the sediments. And I know we have the harbor estuary program. It's been a little slow lately, but under the harbor estuary program, they're looking at toxics, they're looking at pathogens, they're looking at dissolved oxygen and nutrients. But there are different programs out there that we've been looking at. For CSO, we haven't been looking at that much. A lot of it's legacy, I know, but in terms of CSO... We've been really focusing more on bacteria and dissolved oxygen. Except in the Superfund area. Yes. And we don't think it's contributing to the Superfund area based on all the data we collected, but... Yes. Hi, Keith. I think maybe the, that whole thing with floatable control, environmental dredging, wetland restoration, and daylighting is reversed. Because I think that, that increasing complexity I, is a technical thing. Yes, I like I said, yeah, like I said, that, that toolbox may not always be the most accurate. And like I said, daylighting, the difficult thing here is just getting the land. And that's always one of the biggest challenges. No, we have the land. We're get the <laughs> we have the land, it's much easier. But it's, I know all our projects, land is one of the biggest challenges. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Paul, there's two. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the quantitative pieces that you offer, Keith, you know that. But what I would love to see, actually, in terms of the mussels issue, 2,000 gallons of out per square foot per day for mussels, you could basically use your same hydraulic model against that and basically do a comparison. The same thing with, in the last talk, the infrastructure, because every 100 foot, roughly speaking, of street, 25 feet wide, it's about, roughly speaking, 1,500 gallons. It's one filling of uh, basically the standard street size swale, you can double or triple that, your own data and ours, basically, much data all over the world. So what I'm saying is basically you could have, and we would love to see, the same kind of hydraulic, hydrological comparison with the cost, because it's water captured per event, per unit of either street size swales or mussel or oyster restoration, and if you compare those, it would be a beautiful thing. And then we would have we would have a way to see what kind of gallons you got per restoration, you know, per your different pieces. 
And I think I think you'd have less trouble with that than with your table here. And you know that would maybe take it slightly easier. But, uh, uh, I'm going to take it back. That is going to be a difficult. Uh, na apples to apples. And the other thing I have to okay. take back is I don't think the models right now have bivalves in there. Jamaica Bay does. I don't know. If, I don't think the SWEM model, the system wide. That work goes back to the 50s. I mean, just in terms of yeah. capacity. So it's just, it's not like we have to invent what they do. And as Tim mentioned over here, we have data on what muscles do. Right, right. Oh, yeah, we can do it more empirical and just yeah, guess. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that, it just would be great to see. Cause then we could see, you know, you because you, you've worked with water, so do the muscles, you know, invite them into the club. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sean. Uh, thanks. You, you said at the outset uh, with your data that there's you're you're hoping to look more closely at about eight of all of the CSOs, the biggest ones. Um, given that you're going to focus in on those larger CSOs, have you already done a, a loose analysis here of things you're not going to consider, or is everything on the table? Right now, everything's on the table, and we're also looking at something else. Is under uh, the current consent order, we have to look at something early tippers, regulators that may tip when the plant's down at two times. So we're looking at everything. I mean, it helps us focus which outfalls we think would be the priority. But again, we look for opportunities. There's a lot of things in there. So so, so when you're, uh, what, what you're asking of us today is to give you feedback to say things like, don't do disinfection. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, you heard that. Yes, yes. I don't think you're getting disinfection here, but you can give that feedback. But yeah, bivalves, yes. It's going to be the next steps, things we may have missed here, and things, sensitive receptors, and yes. So if you Sorry. Want, in, in, your, in your analysis, if you compare how much you can, like the amount of water that you can save, and your only, your only goal on green infrastructure is one inch capture, I think that, you know, it's, going to, it's not going to come out very good in, when you measure it against something else. And I don't see why you can't increase the amount of capacity that a green infrastructure facility can do. And we'd be happy to talk to you about that, of course. Um, but the one inch is really not quite enough. It's, I mean, that's like going to kill it. It's, it's we're, again, we didn't sort the old terms yet. The one inch was selected just based on statistical values. 90% of the rainfall events are one inch or less. So that was kind of the sweet spot that we thought... If we start chasing those larger events, there may not be a payback in terms of CSO. It may help in terms of resiliency and future things in terms of um, cloud burst. And it's something, again, we can look at, but the, that one inch is really taken just statistically saying when it rains, simply it rains 90% of the time, it's one inch or less of rain. So if we capture that, we handle a lot of the CSOs. But the part of the storm that really harms a lot of other infrastructure, not just yours, but like the DOT, is the ferocious rain that comes, and you could use the green infrastructure to take care of that. Right, and we are, that's more that cloud burst I was talking about, and we are looking at that. It doesn't have that CSO benefit, but it's more sustainability. But it does have a CSO benefit. It has, yeah. It's cutting down the amount of water. It does, that's it does. The pipe. It's the same thing like daylighting, it's cutting down a large amount of water that goes into the pipe. Right, it does. It's again, we the one inch was picked for that one reason, but we are looking particularly in the Jamaica drainage area. We look at the cloud burst. We're saying green infrastructure instead of just getting the CSO benefit. If we can retain that stormwater, keep it out of the sewer system, prevent flooding. Right. But we are looking at that not only for the CSO, but in terms of other programs. What triggers a CSO event? Right. Yeah, just the rain wow. depends the volume. Typically, the the intensity of the rain, the volume of the rain. A short-term heavy rain would not necessarily trigger a CSO event, I think. It was the opposite. It's the opposite. Long-term may not, but every drainage area is different, and we look at that. I mean, on average throughout the city, it rains 100, 110 times per year. Probably CSOs probably occur 30 to 40 times per year. But it's, yeah, it's mainly the intensity of the rain is what causes it. It just overwhelms the sewer system capacity and... That's why the regulators are there, so they kind of relieve the sewer to prevent flooding. And I'm, just, there was, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so um, do you put a lot of people at ease today, with, even though there's a crude chart, X and Y? It's very crude. Um, but you put a lot of people at ease knowing that GI um, and daylighting are actually part of long-term control policy and they're not siloed. Um, 
that was uh, frankly something I really wanted to see tonight, that it's part of your toolkit. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure you knew um, and stated publicly that there are uh, things that are ongoing that are not just variables here for you, but ongoing projects in this district that make this unique. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I represent not only BCQ, but the community board. And um, we have positions, we have research, we have ongoing projects dating back to 2013 on this when you started just okay. anticipating this very eventuality that you would come to us last. Okay. Having seen best practices um, and having then in the intervening years seen important capital projects um, like the uh, um, uh, Jamie's um, uh, wetlands restoration um, um, really contribute to CSO relief that do need funding, okay, and uh, can contribute quantifiable results. So I would just like to know that um, the agencies are going to work with each other, number one. Number two, that you'll be able to take seriously uh, the quantifiable results of everything that we're doing that you're well aware of, including stuff you may not even know about, like the community board's green infrastructure resolution, um, that this should be the first resort um, and start to measure. We actually feel starved the GI here in this area. Okay. Um, and we can't really map it. We need your help in finding out areas that have received GI investment. Uh, we haven't seen it here from DP, and we really are ready for you. Um, okay. As well, and I'm sure Parks would echo this. Um, so, would you be able to tell us first of all that your DP is? willing to work with parks and help parks on these crucial measures, number one. And number two, can you tell us some good, happy results of GI investments that you've made in other communities you just started talking about? Okay. I may give that to Melissa. We definitely all work with parks and all the agencies. But Yeah, but the money, I know you talk, but the money is the important thing. Yes, yes, and there's been a lot of money. I can have Melissa talk on this. And this area, again, we want to get this feedback. We want to work with you. And we are. We know this is one of the areas we're following up on now, trying to get more of the GI in. Okay. Okay. So I think I know uh, what the question. Part. Several questions, maybe. Um, we work with parks very closely. Um, we have a number of partnerships with them that we utilize to fund green infrastructure, either directly through their existing programs or through what we refer to as DEP-initiated green infrastructure projects on parks. Um, and we'll continue to do that and evaluate additional opportunities for this, um, this area if, if those exist. So ju just in terms of topography, you're dealing with a giant bunch of real estate here. Sure. DPR that has to be calculated. Okay, um, and it may not, Community Board 8 is not unique in having, uh, I might say Pelham, um, is another area that quantifiably occupies just a lot of space. So it, by definition, parks and DDP seem to be partners here. Sure, yeah, it, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we uh, have a lot of um, biweekly meetings and calls with parks just on green infrastructure. Um, and we'll continue to do that and through this project or through this process this LTCP planning process We'll evaluate um, opportunities. We've also received um, some Potential projects list from some stakeholders uh, Here tonight and we're evaluating those as well and hoping to have further conversations with them. So definitely We're we're in the game with parks We're at tipping points <laughs> yeah. on a lot of funding things including the Empire State uh, and, and Greenway, so that's true. Ownership. But okay. um, what I just wanted to hear about good results from GI that prevented. We're all into prevention here rather than treatment. Okay, the capture rather. So are there? Um, uh, uh, I just wanted to hear about some some impactful GI investments uh, as, uh, that have been made in other areas of the long term control plan. For prevention. Yeah, that actually were, that were, were put in with the intention of uh, helping out with CSOs. Replacing green yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. Um, did everyone hear the question? Do you want to repeat it? No, the best practices. You yeah. So it, with green infrastructure, it's 
more challenging to identify one specific project and say this one blue belt or this one green roof had a direct impact on preventing CSOs, right? Because we're talking about decentralized infrastructure and many different smaller projects working together as a network to manage stormwater. So when we look at the areas where we have what we called our priority tributary areas, so for those of you who are engaged in one of our other LTCPs, maybe Flushing Bay or Newtown, you remember those maps where we showed a particular CSO outfall, the area that was tributary to it, and all of the green infrastructure that was going in. So that might have been rain gardens, parks retrofits, and NYCHA retrofit, and so on. We calculate all of those and then look at what the magnitude of impact is from the green infrastructure. So I know that back in 2016, we released our performance metrics report, and I'm looking at Melissa because I don't exactly remember the ratio, but um, we can certainly share that with you in terms of our calculations of if we capture X amount of volume, we anticipate an X amount reduction of CSO. Now, of course, that varies depending on, um, like as Karen mentioned, whether you're managing one inch or 1.5 inches, whether you have 200 rain gardens or 500 rain gardens or three groups or so on, the watershed itself, the sewer shed itself. So there's a lot of variabilities in that, but the good news is that through the early pilots that we built, we were able to show that green infrastructure is very effective at capturing stormwater. So that's like, great, we did it. We know we can capture stormwater with our green infrastructure. And then as we look at the implementation and all of the different opportunities, whether it's public property or as Melissa talked about, the private property side, what are we expecting in terms of the CSO reduction? So it's one of those, those challenging things when you compare the green infrastructure side to the gray. You can build a 25 million gallon CSO tunnel and say, okay, this is exactly how much volume we're capturing. Green, a little bit more nuanced depending on the opportunities, but of course you have all of the additional benefits that everyone here has talked about tonight. So that's how we balance it, um, and that's really why from the start of the long-term control plan process back in 2012, it really was a green and gray approach and looking at all of these. Though I think one of the big takeaways from tonight is that we should also just show this chart as bullets. I like that's <laughs> kind of where we're going to go from here. Yeah, Sean. On the green infrastructure issue, I know that since the beginning of all this, the plan was always to have 10% of the CSO area controlled by green infrastructure. Um, there was a 2015 to 2030 plan for that. And as of last August, the contingency plan that you guys asked for with the state, where you said we're really far behind on a lot of our targets, um, the 2015 target was pushed to 2020, you might not catch up. And the rumor was that at previous meetings that you were only going to hit that 10% uh, target in some of the other watersheds like Newtown Creek or Flushing Creek. Uh, we didn't see anything here, and in the other kickoff meetings, you usually say, you know, given that one of the baseline conditions we're working with is we're going to have 10% coverage with green infrastructure. Um, are you anticipating still trying to get to that 10% in this in this drainage area to the Harlem River uh, and along the west side of Manhattan, or are you moving away from that? So, I mean, obviously the Swim Coalition and a lot of environmental organizations here tonight are engaging with us on the contingency planning. Um, I think that, and I'm looking at Melissa to correct me if I'm wrong, but in the consent order, there were specific green infrastructure targets for specific water bodies, and I'm not sure if there was one for East River and open waters the way that there was for others. And so that's why you don't have that like baseline the way we did in, say, um, the Bronx River, where it was like 14%. This was the baseline that was cooked into the LTCP. But let me follow up with you on that, just in case I'm wrong. Um, but you're right in that the way we prioritized the green infrastructure were for the specific tributaries and water bodies where we thought that we would have the most impactful to the gentleman's earlier question about like where's the kind of bang for your buck and where do you see the benefits of the GI from a volume perspective, 
we did prioritize those water bodies. And so that's why you don't see a rain garden contract area for the Harlem River the way you saw for Bronx River or Westchester Creek or Hutchinson. So that does not mean that we're not prioritizing green infrastructure, particularly in East River and open waters. Many of you know that we do have contract areas in East River open waters. There's NCB 14, which is an outfall along the East River on the Brooklyn side. We have a very large contract there. We have one in BB005, which is East River, sort of on the north side. Um, so moving through that uh, sort of largest CSO outfall with the most CSO volume and biggest water quality impact has been the driving approach so far. But I think a big takeaway from what Melissa presented is that we're looking for the nuances and where we can expand our programming. So that's pursuing the private side. It's looking at further opportunities with our partners. None of those things reflect us moving away from green infrastructure. If anything, we're pushing farther. We're pushing our city agency partners farther. We're pushing OMB farther than they'd like to go sometimes. Um, but that's because our group has been so committed to green infrastructure, and we've seen the success of it. We come out here. We know that communities want it. Um, and so we'll continue to push that, but we'll continue to ask sometimes for patience in that some water bodies went first, and now we're coming to others. Yes, Laura. Um. Uh, as you know from our resolution, we've had issues with the private grant program, and that's why I, I'm very enthusiastic to learn about the new private property retrofit program. And I wanted to hear again about the timeline, and uh, we at the community board would definitely be interested in partnering with you to get the word out to institutions. and. Uh, you know, private property owners when that program is ready to roll out and it's mm -hmm. new and improved. Sure. Yeah, so timeline again for the new private property retrofit incentive program. We hope to have an RFP out in the second quarter of this year that takes, you know, mm -hmm. lots of different agency review, so it's, you know, not completely up to DEP. Um, we should have then, once we select an administrator through public procurement, it'll take us at least a year to get a contract registered with them. So we're really looking to kick that off in probably fiscal year 20. Um, but that being said, we need to have projects lined up for that third party administrator the second that contract has a notice to proceed. So we will start engaging with private property owners and community organizations to help us this spring. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Good. Yeah. Uh, this might be a question for Chief. <clears throat> Are you guys, in terms of the modeling and the characterization, you know, and understanding there's a fair amount of mixing in both the Harlem and the Hudson, are you guys going to be looking at environmentally sensitive areas, uh, in particular sort of the boat houses and uh, maybe the uh, Hudson River Marine Sanctuary has been particular points of focus, or how are you going to address that? Um, we do look at sensitive areas. In, in a certain way, now that the uh, water quality standards of bacteria are the same everywhere, it kind of puts less focus on there that we're, we're meeting primary contact everywhere. But we always look at sensitive areas. It's just a little different now because now we're looking at everywhere to be primary contact. So it kind of takes the focus a little bit away, but we do still look at that. We'll look at the beaches, boathouses, things like that. Yes, ma'am. So first of all, thank you for acknowledging that daylighting to this group is a solution. Um, and I wish you had mentioned it before the councilman left. But so we have a coalition of you know 24 organizations and elected officials who are supporting the daylighting. And you stated that the hardest of one of the obstacles is getting the property. And I believe that they will pony up the money to purchase the property if they know the DEP will then do the daylighting. So there's no way they can afford both the property and the daylighting in their budgets, but they could do the property purchase if you guys commit to the daylighting. So if you can make the daylighting part of your LTCP, we can get that property. Yes, sir. 
when you do the comparisons between alternatives, is it a factor that the cost of the treatment, if we can just decrease the number of gallons that go to the sewage treatment plant every day, doesn't that have some value in terms of the dollars per gallon required to treat it? It does. And then what about the fact that we diverted so many gallons from the need for treatment, then you don't have to build additional capacity in order so to... So you're talking about Tibbetts Brook again? Or yeah, just, but, yeah. But in terms of measurable... Yeah. Right, right. That one has more of an easy impact where you're taking out the dry weather flow. We do, we will account for that. Most of these are wet weather controls. You don't see that as much, but for Tibbetts Brook, it would be you're, refused, you're eliminating a few MGD from treatment. How, so. do you, how much is it, a, a thousand gallons to do sewage treatment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I have no clue. I have the number somewhere. I do it by a million gallons. I don't remember the number. Well, what, what is the measurable? It's six, six, six dollars per hundred gallons, I think, about right now. I, I, that sounds high. So I, I'll I, get back to you. I really don't know right now. It's, that's, that's it. It's six dollars per hundred gallons. And that's the yeah, yeah. We have those numbers. I'll, I can find uh, I, that out. I have, I have a one, here, I okay. So, so Paul, our, our deputy commissioner for the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment and Plant Wastewater Treatment Group is here, and she's saying it depends on the treatment plant. So, we'll we'll have to come back to that one. On your website, which I talk about anyway. <laughs> um, so, just to oh, Corinne, go ahead. It'll be our last question. Yeah, so I think we'd have to follow back up with you in terms of whether there is a plan for Harlem River to specifically have a right-of-way contract. Um, in terms of whether we're open to other types of green infrastructure techniques, yes. And I think that for those of you and Paul and some other folks have shared data and shared information with us, we're always happy to look at that, evaluate it. You know, I, I try to encourage folks to remember that this, it's still a, a relatively young program in comparison to the world of everything else that the agency does, right? So we have pipes that are from the 1914s, 1910s, I should say, um, and our, our GI program has been around since 2012. We've tried to be as adaptive and as flexible as we can. So for those of you who are plugged into how our designs have changed, how our construction techniques have changed, you'd probably be familiar with that. Um, in terms of what we can do for areas like the Bronx where there are challenges with infiltration, um, we're certainly open to exploring those. And again, you know, even from the time that um, BCEQ and Community Board 8 reached out to us at the beginning of the process, it was very clear that green infrastructure, ecological projects are a priority for this community. And so, yes, we will continue to evaluate them. Also, within the context of all of the other types of projects that we have to evaluate just as part of the long-term control plan. Um, but I think that's a great question in terms of transitioning to our next steps and, and kind of what happens at this point. Um, as I mentioned, this particular LTCP is very large, and so we have two more kickoff meetings that are, are coming your way. Um, one in East River that will be in March, um, and we'll have a date for that. It's actually March 7th, um, but the announcement for that will go out by the end of the week. Um, and then we'll be doing the third meeting in Staten Island. So we'll be wrapping all of these kickoff meetings up by this spring. Um, as Keith mentioned, we'll be going through all of the different um, steps in terms of modeling, looking at different alternatives, and we'll come back to you to discuss those alternatives and the ones that you've shared with us and our assessment of those. Um, and we'll be able to get more feedback from you at that time. Um, then we'll come back as we select 
our final LTCP or select our plans, we'll come back and we'll share that final selection with you. Um, you'll have an opportunity to review the selected alternatives, provide comments to us. We'll respond to those comments, make changes as necessary before we submit that plan to the state. Um, and so as always, you can continue to submit comments to us either from this evening or ongoing to our website, um, ltcp at dep.nyc.gov. Um, tonight's presentation will be available online tomorrow. Um, a lot of the future kickoff meetings, the sort of um, bookend content will be very similar, but obviously the water quality data and analysis will be specific to that area. Um, and then I'd strongly encourage you to visit our website. We um, unveiled a lot of new resources last fall, a brochure, water body specific pages, um, and you can sign up. All of you, uh, just for attending tonight, you get added to our listserv, so you'll hear all about um, our future meetings. So that is it, unless there are any last questions. Would you be able to put the presentation on the website? Yes, uh, that presentation will be online by tomorrow. And yes. Do you have a deadline by which you have to report back to the DEC with the plan? We do. So uh, currently that deadline is um, December 2018. But for many of you who know have been following this process pretty closely, you know that it's a new element that we are going to be sharing the selected alternative to the public um, before we submit to the state. So at this point, our deadline is still December 2018. Um, but if we run into challenges with that timeline, we may be asking for um, an extension. We may not. We'll sort of know that along the year. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Get home safely.